We're going in. First session of day two. Who's awake? Who's not? Let's find out. So, we're all. Who can remember being at school? Just looking around the audience, looking at myself. It's been a while, right? And was anyone who was good at maths? Which is, by the way, the correct way of saying it. Maths with an S. You can take the S off Lego. It's fine. Um, I was not very good at maths, and I can still remember being in the classroom, some maths problem, couldn't figure it out. And you know that sixth sense feeling when everybody else in the room knows it, and they've finished it, and they're just waiting for you? Yep. Teacher got that as well, obviously. It's on me. Didn't know the answer. And that feeling, it's that horrible sinking feeling, isn't it? Of feeling stupid, and of, being, of looking super foolish. I'm going to ask a kind of personal question, which is, I'm going in deep for right at the start of day two. Um, you don't have to answer this. Has anyone ever been scammed out of money? Okay, it's, it's not a great feeling. Um, I do some work with a charity, and um, last year, there were these two really big payments came out from one of the, the people who had access to the accounts. Not very well explained, um, all kind of slightly vague, and it turns out she'd been scammed. And... Uh, the, the real thing was that she was so adamant that she hadn't been. She was so adamant she was doing the right thing that she couldn't tell us that it was all a secret and we would end up, it would all get resolved and when it did, we would end up apologising to her for what had happened. People, she just couldn't see it. She was so adamant she didn't want to be wrong. She didn't want to admit that she'd been tricked. People don't like to feel stupid. They don't like that feeling of feeling foolish. Why am I talking about all of this? This is supposed to be a, bot, a talk about bot experiences and I've hit you at half past eight with being scammed and all the rest of it. <coughs> well, bot experiences are both really simple and also really hard. There's no user experience, there's no CSS, there's no design, there's no layout, there's nothing to kind of hang your hat on, which is freeing and fun, but it also means there's no direction, there's no guide, there's no signposting, there's no clues. Lots of people write bots like this. Do you know what this looks like right now for users? It looks like this. This is our secret club. You have to know the special keywords to use this and get in here. And if you don't know, it isn't going to tell you, and it isn't going to tell you nicely either. Error, command not found. And if you don't know, you can't use it. And you don't know the special words, do you, user? You're not special like us. But every day, people are putting out bots that look like that to their users, that are scary and unfriendly, just like a command line. <coughs> and it's making people feel stupid. And they don't like it. Now, it would be OK if your bot could answer anything you gave it, if this command line was somehow sentient, and you could just put it in and it would answer. That's the only way this sort of thing kind of makes sense. But that is hard, right? And there's kind of competition in this space for doing stuff like that. Think about this. Google totally disrupted search back in the day because they created a search engine that didn't make you feel stupid. You put in what you wanted, and it told you where to get it. It told you the answer. You didn't have to know anything about how the web really worked. Compare that to... I haven't got a screenshot, I should have put it in from like, do you remember Yahoo Pages with their like a whole million pages of links that you had to like navigate through, you had to know exactly where you needed to go. Other examples, these two, trying to answer anything that you throw at them, but also giving enough wrong answers enough times to remind you how hard it all is. But here's the difference. These tools are trying to solve that ask me anything problem. And you're not, at least I hope you're not. You have a problem domain. You have a problem you're trying to solve. It might be your company, your organization, your HR team, the holiday booking process, your website, whatever it is. And that means you don't have to try and answer every question. But Tom, I can hear you say, what about ChatGPT? Won't that help? OK, so we are going to talk about ChatGPT because it is kind of dominating the space right now. We are going to talk about it. But well, we're going to talk about it in a moment. We're going to talk about something else first. I want to tell you a quick story um, about, we're going, to go back, we're going back to school for a minute, different part of my education, uh, a little bit older, uh, in what's called uh, A-levels, which you 
early 2000s, I was 16 to 18, and one of those was computer science, and my computer science teacher was called Mr. Toon. I remember Mr. Toon vividly for two reasons. One, he was allergic to peppermint, and the reason I remember that is we went on a school trip to, back in the 2000s, when you were doing computer science, a fun school trip is to go to the National Weather Centre, because back in the 2000s, the largest computers were in the weather centres, and you were allowed to just show up with a bunch of kids and look around the computers. I don't think you can do that anymore. But we went and had a look at this computer, and it was very big. Um, but on the way back, in the minibus, somebody had a mint. And Mr. Toon was like, I can smell mint. Who's got the mint? And none of us would, it wasn't me, none of us would own up to, uh, to having the mint. So Mr. Toon drove two and a half back, hours back to school with all the windows down. And I have never felt so cold. Anyway, the other reason, the more important reason that I remember Mr. Toon is he had this massive sign um, in his classroom. And it was printed on that dot matrix printer that's all like fan folded together. It was across like 10 sheets, massive. And he, he would point up at it all the time. This said, typing is no substitute for thinking. Okay. Every single time, and he drummed it into my head and it stayed with me ever since. Typing is no substitute for thinking. And in some ways, Microsoft make it almost too easy to just jump in and start building a bot. They give you the sample, they give you the code that you can download and run it, and it will work out of the box. You can get an Echo Bot up and running with no effort at all. And then you can just dive in and start going. But I think it's really important not to do that and to start before you start building, to map things out, map out the journey that your user is going to take, like a flowchart. And start with, is a bot even the right tool? If, if all you want to do is look at a body of knowledge and return the results, maybe a website actually is a better thing for that. It's really important to think about outcomes as well. What do I mean by that? I mean, let's say you're creating a bot, and often those bots are supplementing an existing system. Okay, so there's already a way of doing something, and you're adding a bot on top to make it easier or faster or different or whatever. The outcomes have to be the same. If it's a holiday booking process, if I go through the bot and it tells me I've got 10 days holiday and lets me book some holiday and, and tells me it's booked, it does actually have to be booked. It can't take 24 hours later before it goes into the system because of some weird process. It can't get it wrong and tell me I've got 20 days instead of 10 days. It has to be absolutely consistent with the other things that are going on. And this happens all the time. And you, you don't get lots of chances to try this. You get one chance with a user when they start, when they use your bot for the first time. If you do it wrong once, you really put them off. You get one chance to make a good impression. Okay, I did promise. Let's come back and talk about ChatGPT for a little bit um, and where I think it sits in all of this. Let's just level set with some definitions of things because everybody is talking about it. Not everybody knows all about it. So ChatGPT is a chatbot built on GPT 3.5 or 4. Pick your language or pick your version. GPT 3.5 and 4 are large language models of general text. Okay, a large language model, big model around language. Okay, it models the language, so it vaguely knows when these things happen. They normally finish by these other things. Okay, its job is to complete prompts. When I say this, you say that. Okay, most of the time. Um, based on looking at large amounts of data. What I said was, its job is to complete a prompt based on looking at a large model of data. That is quite different from being right or wrong. Okay? One of the problems I see with this is that when it gives its answer, because it's drawing on such a large body of information, it can provide answers that sound very much like all of the other right answers, even though they might not actually be right. It presents information that can be confidently wrong. I don't know why I wrote this on the slide, because now I have to try and say it. <laughs> but if you don't know what it means, it means sounding like a person, acting like a person. And we often, uh, or like having the characteristics of a person, we often attribute those kind of qualities to bots. It is you know, it's smart, or it's clever, or it's snarky, or it's cross, or it's evil, or it's all of these things. It's none of those things. It is trying to complete a prompt based on its input. I hadn't planned on doing this as an example, but two days ago, something kind of happened which is the perfect demo for this. I was messing around, I was supposed to be working, and I thought, I will ask GPT what sessions I should attend at Commsverse. Sounds sensible. 
so you might not be able to read this at the back, but I'm a software developer, I do solutions on Teams and stuff like Graph, I'm attending a conference, here's the schedule, find me 10 things that I should attend. Sounds sensible, right? Here are 10 sessions you should attend. And I looked at them and thought, these are great, look at these, these are all up my street, I, could do all, I can go and watch all of these. I don't think I've seen them on the schedule. Are they on the schedule? No, no, they're not on the schedule. But here are some that are on the schedule. Okay, fine, whatever. So I had another look. I was like, well, they still look. I don't think I've seen them before. Well, why don't I take the first one? Okay, because building apps for Microsoft Teams with Microsoft Graph. I could go to that session. Is that session on the schedule I provided? Yes, absolutely. And it's on day one between 10 and 11.30. Now, if you were here yesterday, you know that sessions didn't start until 11 o'clock. Confidently wrong. So I thought, okay, maybe it's just got confused. Maybe I'll start again. But what I'll do is I'll say, well, now that you think that's, I think something different. So why don't I ask you what's happening between 10 and 11 o'clock on day one? It's a kind of sensible test, right? Actually, there's a keynote happening at that same time. It's called The Future of AI, Hype versus Reality, and it's by John Smith. There is no session, The Future of AI, Hype versus Reality, although it sounds good. And there definitely is no John Smith. This is a hallucination. But it's not really a hallucination you could pick up on. If you didn't have access to the schedule, all of that stuff. Oh, my music. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, tech. Um, Whoops. Uh, <clears throat> fixed it. Uh, yeah. If you didn't have access to the schedule, you wouldn't know whether that was right or wrong. And it is presented very confidently wrong. But this isn't even, this is exactly the sort of stuff we have to be really careful of. Okay, because it sounds like it's probably right. And this isn't even a particularly hard problem to solve. This website is basically a table of sessions. Okay. All right. ChatGPT is a bit of a sledgehammer but most of the time, all we're trying to do is crack a nut, okay? Doesn't mean it's not useful, but it does mean that it's really important to figure out what it does and what it is useful for and what you can use instead, okay? Where it gets more useful is if you take, just don't take it as it comes as ChatGPT, but take the model, refine it to a super tight subset, use your data to fine tune its answers, that will give you better quality results, okay? This is an iterative process. Doesn't mean it won't go wrong. Doesn't mean you won't get hallucinations. You absolutely will. But if you're going to do it at all, you have to go through this step of creating a model that is much more tightly scoped. By the way, this process that we're going to get super familiar with in the next couple of years because large language models are going to become really fashionable and GPT is already super fashionable. So we're going to get very familiar with this. Take your data, put it through a data model, get an API for getting answers to questions. Does that look at all familiar to anyone? There's a conference called Future Decoded. It happened in 2017. I'm sure this happened around the world as well, but these are the only slides I could find because 2017 is ages ago. We've been doing this in bots for ages. This is using Microsoft Cognitive Services, which existed way before GPT. You can take your data, make it into a data model, and then get an API for answering questions. Now, is it as good as what GPT is doing? No. GPT is definitely a smarter thing, but we've been building these models, these language models, and putting them inside bots for ages. So, should we rip up everything that we know about building good bots just because ChatGPT is here? No, I don't think so. I think what we're going to see is that the tech that we use today will just get better and better. So our existing ways of building bots with cognitive services and models are going to get smarter and smarter because of the innovations in building language models and, how, and using them and accessing them and stuff. But I think it's still very important that we plan, design, and think about the experiences we're giving to users, um, and that is just as important as it ever has been. By itself, GPT is not going to be the silver bullet to good bot design because it isn't going to make a bot that can do everything and it can get things wrong. Word of warning, I would say, do not present your bot as a bot that can do everything. 
or anything perfectly just because you put GPT into it, and be super wary about relying purely on GPT-generated material. Okay. By the way, uh, if you haven't heard of No Silver Bullet, it's a really old paper from like the 80s, um, 86, I think. But it's still, I think, it's still super relevant today. Okay, so we agree we've still got some more work to do. We agree that the command line approach isn't great. Then we need, and we agree we need to kind of scope to a particular problem domain. If we're going to do all of that, then we need to give our users options, and in order, we need to frame our bot, basically, into our problem domain. But that means knowing what our users might want to do before we even start, knowing how users are going to use our bot. And that means thinking about how, how people use it before you start building. Typing is no substitute for thinking, if you came here early enough. See? Maybe I should get some those stickers made with that on. Anyway. So, before you start, five questions you need to ask yourself before you write a line of code. Obviously, what problem am I solving? Obvious but important. Lots of people don't do this. They dive in, and then they sort of think of one thing and do it, and then they think of another thing and do it, and they keep going. If you can't answer this really well, question whether or not you should be writing a bot at all. And I don't mean like, you shouldn't be allowed to. I just mean question whether or not a bot is the right implementation for the problem you're solving, if you can't answer this really sort of easily and well. Also, as important, you need to define the boundaries of your system. You need to know this before you start, because knowing this before you start means that you can help guide your users, because they will hit those, and you need to be telling them that, yes, I know that's the thing you might want to do, but it's not a thing I can do. Who's the bot for? This is an interesting one because there might be multiple answers. You might have multiple personas. Let's take, keep coming back to the HR holiday bot, right? Who's that for? If somebody shows up and asks it a like a question about HR holiday policy, how should you answer? You will probably answer differently if it's somebody who's on their first day, or somebody who's been in the company for three years, or somebody who works in HR. Three completely different questions, really. So knowing the persona is important. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. OK, so similar to question one, but be much more specific. Literally write out 10, quest 10 things that your users are going to ask. Because okay? that really helps you think about how to prioritize and how to sort of frame what we're going to go into in terms of framing the journey. And then character. You do have to think about that, unfortunately. And you, you can sort of approach it in a couple of different ways. And Microsoft sort of helps because they ship, if you're using Microsoft Bot Framework, they will ship with some default character sets for like the, um, the kind of welcome messages like hi and how are you and all those sort of filler, word, filler sort of greetings. Um, and you can choose things like being funny or being professional or being kind of deadpan. And it doesn't really matter um, as long as you all agree what you're doing and you're consistent. Quite often, especially in larger companies, uh, if the work of implementing the bot is split out into different teams, by accident you can end up with different characters. And that can be pretty confusing as a user. If you've got like, you ask one question and it's like kind of super chatty, and then you ask another one and it's like deadpan serious at you, it's kind of weird. So understanding what the character is going to be up front really, really helps. Okay. Define your success criteria. And this is really like, okay, so you're going to write, by, go and build this thing. How will you know if it's going to work? And this is no different from any other piece of software. Don't treat bots like any other, like that you've got to treat them you know, just like any other project. How is it valuable? What problem is it solving? How are you going to look back at, it, back at it and say this worked? So you can do this in different ways, like being accurate. So what percentage of the time can it solve the problem? You could do it by how much it gets used. Or quite often, because bots are going in alongside other systems, you can measure it by a reduction in use of those systems. Why is it important? Normally, because it's linked to something your company cares about, and usually that is money. So as an example, this bot that we're going to write will be successful if it answers more than 60% of interactions, is used by more than 100 people daily, and reduces help desk tickets by 10%. Why do we care? Because a 10% reduction of help desk tickets equates to a saving of whatever. Okay? That is the reason for building a bot, not just because Framework v4 is out, or ChatGPT is cool, or we kind of have some leftover resource. Like, that's the reason you need to do it. 
all of that stuff I've just really, if you want to be, I think, you should put it all on one page, a bit like a plan on a page, okay? The answers to your questions, your success criteria, your audience, key individuals, and then that becomes one document that you give to everybody. We're going to come back to using that in a bit when I come to talk about testing and stuff, but I think that really helps because you can give it to your developers as well. They've got some key questions, they've got some success criteria, um, and it, it just kind of makes it a bit more like a regular software project than just kind of a thing on the side. All right, okay, so we're done. We've done our design, done the thing Tom made us do, we're ready to start building, great. Except, one thing, I'm kind of gonna make you start somewhere you probably don't want to. Because I know what you want to do if you're a developer. You want to go down the golden path. Because that's fun, and it shows early progress. But we're not going to do that. Quick aside, the golden path um, in software development, it tends to be the minimum amount of work you can do to get to achieving one of more of the primary objectives of the thing you're trying to build. Okay, So it's kind of like, uh, if you go here and you go here and you click this and this, but not that, and click that and that, and put this in exactly like this, and click that button within 30 seconds, then it works. Don't do anything else. Okay? You see POCs. If you get a demo out there, it's probably golden path. Okay? Because they've done it enough times that they know it works. Okay? And developers like to do that first because it looks cool, and then they go and fill in all the other stuff, like all the edge cases, the validation, the bits they don't really want to do, and all that other stuff. And that's fine. It works quite well, and it's good for demos. And it's good for proving stuff works, and you can take it out to users, and they can try it too, and you can get good validation. But there's a problem with doing this with bots. A user can't see a golden path for a bot in the same way that they do for an application. They can't see the menu options. They can't see where to type stuff. There's no signposts. So it's a bit like walking through a forest blindfold. You're back to that command line thing. So. Instead, start with the assumption that your bot cannot do anything, okay? And build to that, okay? So start by assuming that everything your user will ask your bot, it cannot do, and code for that golden path, okay? And then add on your edge cases for the things you actually want the bot to do. What does that look like? I can channel my inner Donald Rumsfeld. This is the unknown unknowns. This is the everything else, okay? Code for that first. Make it the default experience. Make it the first thing you do, and make it really good. When, you, when users get there, don't dead end them, which is like, you can't do that, full stop. This is your error, no command, not found thing, okay? Give users somewhere else to go, even if you haven't coded it yet, and log everything that happens. Make a really good unknown, unknown experience first. Give your user somewhere to go, give them a get out of jail card. And do that logging. The logging stuff is really important, and we're going to come back to it. So here's a bad example. User's shown up, in good faith, to use your bot. And uh, they've asked a very simple question, and your bot has just gone like, bleh, don't care. I mean, maybe that is, maybe, maybe getting holiday is something that that bot can do. It's just been asked wrong. Or maybe it's not something the bot can do. The user has no idea. You just don't know. Here's a better example. And two things have happened here. First of all, it's the same thing. It's the same unknown unknown. No, no development really has taken place here. Okay. The user gets unblocked. Now the user is going to be like, oh, really? OK, whatever. But also, here are the options for the things the bot can do. What you're trying to do here is get your users onto some rails. Okay. Because now the user can scan that, and they'll be like, oh, well, obviously, it's that thing. And they might be like, oh, duh. But they're going to click the button, and they're going to get on to do what they actually want to do. They are unblocked. It's not perfect, but it's way better. Okay. By the way, this thing at the bottom is a really good idea to put in. At the end of all your options for like, what you're trying to do, give the user somewhere else to be like, well, actually, I want to do something else. And just capture it. Capture it and log it. This is a really good way of figuring out how users are actually using your bot by giving them something to do. So your Rails define the scope of your application, and then you've got this everything else 
down the bottom. Okay. When we're coming to like input and getting things going and get users on your rails, don't make the user guess stuff. So if we come back to that question about holiday, that first one, the user literally had to guess the English. They had to guess the combination of words to put together and think like the developer that wrote the system, who wrote it, to see how like, to make the thing work. So try and avoid doing that, or make sure you've really thought about all of the different ways in which people might ask. And that problem is multiplied if you've got multiple languages and all the rest of it. Any time you are taking something that a user wrote, like a sentence or whatever, or some input, you should be using natural language processing. Use the natural language processing stuff that's built into Azure Cognitive Services or anything else. Please do not be looking for magic keywords in the text, in the sentences. I know that sounds really obvious. I see it all the time. Okay. It can't be about the holiday because the user didn't write holiday. They wrote vacation. Whatever. So you could do all of this today. You could do all of, you could do all of this before GPT. Um, the common welcome words thing. So that's when you, I don't know if you've ever watched users use a bot, the first thing they will normally do is, most, most users won't just pile in with the initial question, okay? Again, comes back to not feeling stupid, okay? They will hit it with a, hi, help, question mark, hello, whatever, those kind of chatty words to kind of wake the thing up and see if it's gonna give them some options. Absolutely, you should do that. Give them some options. When you use those, when you get those filler words, those greeting words, Come back to them with like, rather than just, hi, hi, here are some things you can do. So here's our bad example. Here's a better example. So I'll read this out because it's kind of small. This is just like a hello, type your question, good luck. This is, this is me. These are some, some of the things I can do. You could ask me about holiday allowance. You could ask me about submitting requests for approval. Or you could ask me about some general questions about policy. When you're ready, type a question to start. That's better but it's still a little bit vague. Whilst you're here, you might as well do this. Do that same thing, give users those rails. Does that feel like cheating when you're writing a bot like that, to give users buttons to click? It shouldn't, I don't think. You're not trying to make something that appears human. Stop thinking like that. You're building a tool for users to use to get stuff done. And the tool should make it easier than it was before to do that stuff. And if you showing people the two most popular buttons, the two most popular activities that your bot does, because you know, as buttons, so they can click it and get on with their lives, then do that, okay? So, that's how to plan out a good flow. And you should kind of think that through before you do anything else. When we're building bots for teams, we can lean in to making it a better experience than if you just have to support multiple platforms. So when you build a bot framework, you can choose to support lots of different channels or platforms. You could write one bot and have it work in WhatsApp and Teams and other places. Um, or you can choose, actually, this bot is only going to be for Teams because I'm building it for my organization and that's kind of where everyone is and that sort of makes sense. If you do that, you can lean into the additional surfaces. So do this as part of your design thinking. If you've got lots of information to present to users, don't put it all in this massive wall of text. Take them out to a tab, deep link them to a tab in your application somewhere. Um, have things like message compose extensions that make it easier for people to share that content. And make your bot collaborative by taking that content and where it's relevant, posting it into channels, where it's relevant and appropriate. Don't make a spammy bot, but sometimes it does make sense to bring things into channels so other people can collaborate on it, not just the person who kind of started that thing. Another kind of interesting place is where bots can be used to provide notifications to users, okay, which is the other end, other direction of not users coming to bots to kind of get stuff done, but the other way where bots are notifying users. So in Teams, you can send notifications to users via bots. That means you can proactively tell them about things. Use this super sparingly, okay? Too much of this be just becomes noise and then users just stop paying attention to you. Like bots that are spammy generally kind of degrade that whole experience. Um, so focus in on the stuff that's used, like actually important and actually relevant to the user and personalize it as much as possible. So rather than like, you have new activity, 
rather, like there are three things, you know, what is it? It's very specific to that user, what is the thing? Your holiday, your, you know, your holiday request has been approved, whatever. If you're doing this a lot and you've got lots of these things, consider like a daily digest. So you know, you only send something once a day. Something happened to me the other day, which is a really good example of this, or a really bad example, depending on how you put your English together. Microsoft do this. Check out the latest activity in Power BI. Okay. Was there any new activity in Power BI? No, there wasn't. Do I have notifications turned off in Power BI? Yes, I do. Don't do that. Uh, okay, authentication. So developers don't like authentication very much, um, but they should. So authentication is not authorization, they're different. Authentication is knowing who the user is. Authorization is knowing what they're allowed to do. Authentication is good because if you know who your user is, then you can be super specific about the information you present to them and can tell you, knowing who the user is, can tell you a lot of information about the user. Okay, and that means you can make very tailored experiences. Coming back to our example about HR, you could have three different answers and when that user, are, you know, when somebody asked a question, you could give them one of three different answers because you know whether or not they work in HR. You know when they join the company. You can work all that stuff out if you know who the user is. Okay. Um, that does mean you have to decide whether or not you're going to make your users log in to your, before they can start using your bot. Now, you don't have to. You could have a flow where, you know, you could have a whole experience where users can optionally sign in to use your bot or not. And then the answers you give are either tailored or they're not. Things are getting more complicated, or you could mandate that everybody signs in. Then you, at least you can know that you can rely on finding out some stuff in AD, or knowing who they are, or last time they visited, or a million other things that light up once you actually know who the user is. Um, if you are gonna do this, use SSO wherever possible. Um, it's not hard anymore, it used to be hard, it's not hard anymore. Um, teams can pass over loads of like, useful stuff into your bot to make it super easy to do. Go and check out the examples, and there's loads of sample code online for doing it. You can even do it without writing any code if you want to use Bot Framework um, Composer or um, the Power Automate uh, bot builder. Um, so do the SSO thing so that users aren't made to log in. Teams can just pass them uh, the login state. Much, much nicer. Okay, so we've done like the building stage of our design thing, and we're ready to launch. So let's talk a bit about testing. So broadly, there's two different types of testing. There's functional testing is the first type. And this is just like any other app, any other software project where you do testing to figure out if does, has the thing you've built, does it actually work? Bots are no different and they need testing just like any other app. If you're familiar with things like unit tests and mocks, they can really help here because there's no visual UI. Actually, it's not quite, it's not, it's a lot easier than it would be for like a, a Windows application or a UI-based application um, most of the time. So you can actually mock quite a lot of your business flow um, and, and do it that way with unit tests. But the, the standard rules for testing are the same. Um, find good people you know, that like breaking stuff. Be prepared to go back to and sort of rehash things. Um, don't leave it to the last minute. What is obvious to developers is often not obvious to other people. So that's functional testing, and that is important, but there's another type of testing specific to bots that is, in some ways is almost more important, and that is suitability testing. So this, this isn't, does the thing I've built work? It's more, is the thing I've built right? Is it answering the right questions, and is it solving the right problems? Again, what is obvious to developers is very often not obvious to other people. So you can do this in two rounds. This is a good way to do it. Start off with round one. So what is round one? Gather your people. So not developers, not testers. Go and find some end users, some people who will actually be using the system and understand the problem domain. Get them in a room, show them your design document, and take them through it. This is the design document we had. These are some of the questions we thought you might like to ask. These are some of the things it can do. Give them all of that, and then let them play with the bot and see what happens, okay? That's round one. Round two is similar. Go and get a group of people, a different group of people. Don't give them any introduction. Don't give them any explanation. Don't give them your design document. Sit them in front of a computer, see what they do. Okay. If your bot is good, 
at its gratings, at its rails, and all the rest of it, you will not get very much difference between these two. Okay? These people knew what the bot was supposed to do. These people didn't. Try and have developers watch those interactions, and not in a kind of like over-the-shoulder sort of way. Don't do that. <laughs> no? Like video recording is best. Like you will be amazed at what users do. Okay? Amazed. In a good way. This, by the way, this suitability testing, you don't have to wait until you've written your application. Really good teams do it before <laughs> they start writing their application. They save a ton of, mind, a ton of time and money doing it that way. Think about it. You could just mock most of your bot. You could give fake answers, fake responses, put the rails in, do all of that stuff. Be fictional. Don't worry about the business logic. When I say holiday, give me 10 days, whatever. Do all of that, then go to users and do a round of suitability testing. If you really want to, and I've seen this done, make a thing that looks like a bot, but it's actually a person, and hide the person away. A bit like a Turing test. And then have the user talk to the bot. And the, the person on the other end has the design doctrine, so they know roughly what they should be doing, but they can just be like, da, 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 type in the response, and the user's like, this is amazing. Um, but actually, you will find out loads about how users will want to use your bot that way. Okay. All right. So back in the real world, there's no budget for testing. You can't do suitability testing. There's no time. It's not going to happen. So what can you do instead? Well, do what you can before you launch. Try and grab people off the corridors or whatever. And sit them in front of a bot and type two suitability testing is better than type one if you can only do one sort. But if you can't really do that good round of suitability testing, try soft launching first. Okay? So like I said, quite often bots are um, not replacing an existing way of doing things. They're going alongside an existing way of doing things. So if users normally go to this website to book their holiday, maybe put the bot there, but don't tell anyone about it. Some percentage of users will see that, and some percentage of that group will then use it. You'll get a nice, quiet introduction. You don't want to burn everybody all at once this kind of one chance to make a good impression thing, okay? You, so you will annoy some people, but you will annoy all the people. If you're deploying out to Teams, you can use Teams group policy to limit who has access to your application and therefore your bot. Okay? That's not just the pinning on the rail, you can do that too, but literally you just, like, your application was just, won't be available. So you can start with a small group of users and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. If you do these things, it's super important to use telemetry. Monitor what users are doing. Monitor what they're typing. Monitor the paths they go down, the paths they don't go down. Those unknown unknowns, the things they're trying to do. And then decide if that's right, if it's wrong, whatever. So that, that, this, by the way, is much more common. This is testing in the real world. This is what actually happens. The other stuff is what I would like to happen. So, so you're done, you've launched, and you're done, right? Except that you're not. You're never done. I mean, obviously software is never done, but bots are definitely never done. Um, because that conversational UX changes over time. Different people come into the organization. People change how they interact with a bot, especially a bot if they use it every day, they will change how they talk to it. Obviously, requirements and needs, and lang even language changes. Um, you know, new words show up over time. Like, if you've got a bot that's in the company for five years, new words can come along that will get injected in, and people will start using them. Um, and your bot won't know what they mean. It makes it really, really important to continue monitoring that telemetry um, and just see what users are doing. And lots of people don't do this, but they really, really should. It's a really good way of just seeing what your bot is doing. You can absolutely ask users for feedback and suggestions um, and see what they say. And then after all of that, you might consider adding some new features. But actually, this is quite hard. Because I know you've got a big list of cool features you want to put in V2 that didn't make it into V1. But the trouble is, your users have a different set of features. Now, you need to be using that monitoring to figure out what users want to do and take your list of features and see if they line up. And kind of take your ego and put it back in its box because you really need to be going where your users are going, okay? which is hard. It is really hard because you started this project because you wanted to build this great interface to a legacy HR system, 
and make it super easy for everyone to put their holiday, but it turns out everybody just wants to look up weird bits about policy from this FAQ document. It doesn't matter. Like, go where the users are. Okay. So if you are going to do new things, try and make them additive and not disruptive. So on those rails, try and put them at the bottom. The new things go at the bottom. Users get really used to where they're clicking for stuff. Okay? And the, the, the UX, such as it is when you start putting those rails in, is not like super advanced and kind of sophisticated, right? It's just buttons in a list. Okay? So users will get used to that muscle memory. So try and put them at the bottom. It can also be really hard to actually communicate new features to users um, in a bot interface because there is no UI to signal that stuff. They don't know that starting Monday, they can now ask these whole different set of questions. And how are you going to tell them that? That is hard. So um, you can, there's a few different ways of doing it. You can go back through, if you've gone really good messaging and triaging of logs, you could actually go and find those people and say, hey, over the last three months, you've asked our bot a thing it couldn't do, now it can do that thing. You can try these like one time, what's new messages? So first time a user hits a, you know, comes to use your, your bot, it'd be like, as well as saying hello and giving the options, it's like, oh, did you know you can now do this other stuff? It is kind of hard. By the way, if you work in an enterprise um, and you need budget to get your V2 done, a really good way of justifying that is to use those unknown, unknown logs. Like, you know, look at how many people three months tried to do this thing that we can't do, that therefore we need the budget to go and do. It's a really, really good way of getting that project approved. Okay, let's talk about telemetry a little bit, because I've mentioned it a few times. Um, it is super, super important, okay? If you do, I think it's like the number one thing you should do for bots, because you, it's the only way to get really good visibility about what users are actually doing. Um, and it will also tell you where your bugs are, and also it will tell you where your new ideas, ideas are. Now there's, there's, there's good sort of telemetry, if you like, that comes with App Insights in bot framework, but it's also really easy to add your own. You should do that. Um, add your own like business logic logging. So not just errors, not just like users going through this different code flow, whatever, but business logic log logging. This user is trying to book holiday. Okay? As a thing, you can put in App Insights. It's just a, a line, like a, it goes in as an event, okay, alongside all the other bugs and all the other things that are going on. But it means that you can search for that stuff. And you can say, how many times did that business logic, that line, how many times did that show up in the last three months? Or find me all the, you know, the flows where that, it starts with that, what happens after that? Make this sort of logging and telemetry part of the definition of done for new features, okay? If you've got an item in your backlog that says add telemetry, it's never going to get done, okay? Right? <laughs> we've, we've all got one. So make it part of the definition of done. So I'm, I'm going to finish early because I'm hoping there's questions. Um, but things I think are super important. Okay, we've talked about ChatGPT and that silver bullet solution. Okay, and I think this is going to be a thing that really evolves over the next year or so. Um, where we're going to see ChatGPT Chat and GPT, and it's kind of important to separate those two things, um, be put in places where maybe they shouldn't be, or put in places where they're not adding a ton of value. Um, and I think we're going to see a bit of a, the Gartner hype cycle thing, um, where it's kind of amazing, amazing, and then we're going to get into that trough of disillusionment, and we'll kind of see, have to see how that goes. Um, but be aware of those kind of silver bullet solutions. If you're building them into your application, be super like, clear about the value they're bringing and be very cautious about the answers they're telling you if you can't validate them or justify them in any other way. I don't think, and I think we're seeing people understand this and the way they are explaining it away is, oh, yeah, of course, you should always check. You should always check the results you get from this bot. Like, no one's going to do that. Like, if you're not sure, if you have to tell people that, it's not ready. But anyway, um, so that's kind of super important. Language models are really, are really, really useful. Just be careful like, about the ones you're building. Designing before you build is like, the re really, really important. Make that bot design document. Okay? Make sure you put it together. Make sure you keep it. Make sure you keep it up to date. Use it for your testing. Use it for your validation. Start by failing and fail really well. Okay? Because if you can make a really good failing experience, then you will immediately start learning okay, from the things your users are trying to do. Do your testing in the real world as much as you possibly can. And then log everything, 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 all of the time. Okay. 
We do have time for questions, but just before, um, I didn't introduce myself kind of deliberately. I don't really like introduction slides because um, I kind of always think when people start off with like, hi, I'm Tom, and this is why you should listen to me. They're like, really? I'm going to fucking see you for 30 seconds. Um, whereas at least now, you can decide whether you want to or not. Um, so, uh, so, so if you're still listening, um, then yeah, I mean, I do this stuff all the time. I've been building bots for, I don't know, 10 years or something, different companies, big and small, mostly on Microsoft Teams, but not all on Microsoft Teams. Um, but then I also do building Teams apps and things like that, of which bots are one part of it. Um, and then you obviously got the other parts in Teams as well. Uh, and then uh, more recently doing kind of fun stuff with Azure Communication Services and Teams and video and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that is me. We have some time for questions, if there are any. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, sorry. You go first. Yeah, so the question was um, everyone's very excited about bots. Um, do people think they're going to go off bots when they kind of realize they're not right? And, you know. Yes, um, I do think we're going to see the trough of disillusionment in our hype cycle. I think where it, so right now you can go and use ChatGPT and you can ask it some questions and it will give you an answer that's confidently either right or wrong. But you often don't have a very good way of knowing that and validating it unless you put the work in to do the research and nobody is putting the work in to do the research. That example of the session thing, it's very, very easy to go back to the original document and be like, oh, it's totally wrong. Where we're seeing Copilot at the moment um, with Microsoft and what Microsoft are doing with Copilot, um, I think that's going to be really interesting. You know, as some of this stuff comes into the enterprise um, and people start asking questions that are based around language models built around their own data and their own business processes, people know their own data and business processes pretty well. Okay, and so they're going to pick out those things, especially if they're not super incentivized to make the bot succeed, okay, which is the other part of this, is that there's quite a lot of like, fear and uncertainty around jobs and all the rest of it, um, around sort of, you know, is this bot, a bot and stuff going to take my job away? They're going to be super on any inaccuracies. And so I do think we're going to see this kind of slowing down maybe um, or kind of resetting. And then I think we'll get to the point where bots are useful, a useful, I mean, the Copilot, co by the way, is a brilliant branding name for Microsoft for once. Um, because it, it really accurately describes what it is. It's not the pilot. You are the pilot. It's the co-pilot. And if we can get to that, I think we'll be in a good place. Sorry, did you, uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there are, I mean, there are lists you can go and find, but probably a more accurate way is to get it from your users, like if you can. Like, and, th and that speaks to a little bit of like having to put this bot out before it's ready. And do, you can certainly do some initial like looking it up and trying to figure it out, but you're going to get the best answers because it's not, that is definitely a part of it. But also people ask questions in strange ways as well, like that you won't necessarily have thought of. Um, yeah, so... Um, so actually getting that telemetry back again is, that, is super important. Weirdly, actually, things like GPT, being able to look at a large language model, ah, oh, that is actually a really good use case for it because actually you are looking at that language model. It's like, what are the 50 different ways in which people might ask for holiday actually is quite a good use of something like ChatGPT for that. Right, yeah, because actually now you're using it to do what it's intended for, which is to complete a prompt. Hmm. Yeah, so, so the question is like, there's a giving voice to bots. So, um, yeah, so rather than typing as an experience, having voice as the experience. Um, and, and how do I think about that? It can be, 
it's a, it's a tool in the box, right? So text-to-speech text to speech is a thing. It's quite a cool thing, which is why everyone wants to use it, okay? Because it feels like magic. Um, but is it a useful tool? Now, in some circumstances, yes, it can be a useful tool. If you've got a bot, but actually it's easier or better or makes more sense for people to access it over the phone, then there's a good example, right? But you're using the tool to facilitate a new feature or a new way of doing things. Putting it in just because it's cool and making it the only way for users to use it when typing would be faster or more accurate or easier is not helpful. So it, in, that, in those respects, it can be a bit of a gimmick. Um, you make it much harder in a way to get information back from users if all you're doing is saying, like, just tell me what you want to do. Because now you've got two problems. You've got to do speech to text, and you've got you know, inaccuracies will creep in there. And then you've got to figure out what the intent is. Yes, you could read out a million options and make people push things on your keyboard on, a, on your DTMF tones, but now you're kind of doing chat through the phone, which is silly. So like, if you could do it on chat, why not do it on chat? So I'm a bit like, yes, if it makes sense, but it has to make sense. Yeah, so the question for the recording was, um, how can you make bots more uh, sort of engage, help users stay engaged with the process or whatever it is um, when they get disengaged and you know, they're not always coming to the bot keen to get their thing done? Notifications can help um, as long as they're relevant. You know, they can remind users that this process exists or there's a thing they need to do. Um, sometimes you, do, you have to reach them in other means, like email and Teams chat or whatever else it is to kind of bring them back. Um, anything you can offer them um, to kind of make their lives easier can help. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of a good example, but maybe if like they had to fill in some form or something, then you can be like, well, here's the actual link to the form. Um, or you could even try and do some clever things like you know what's in the form as the developer, so you know like the key pieces of information. If you've done the authorization bit, you can be like, hey, I could actually probably pre-fill most of this form for you or here's a list of like the first five answers that I've figured out for you. Um, you can just do the rest, like helping, kind of providing additional carrots, if you like, to kind of help the user do it. Um, but other than that, like it's, yeah, it can be, th those are kind of the ways where it, like notifications can help, but then anything you can offer to kind of make it easier, make it quicker, um, kind of helps. Yeah, so the question is about where you end up with lots of different bots all solving different problems. And yes, definitely seen this. Um, and it sort of does make sense, but what yeah, you end up with the user now having to figure out which bot to go to to get the job done, which isn't helping anyone. You can create a bot for that. You can create a bot for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's, in some ways, that is the answer. Like, you create a master bot, whatever. Um, how, ex how exactly and like how connected it is to the other bots is up to you you can make it be the only bot, and all users funnel through that bot, and it just kind of hands off in the background. You can totally do that. Or you can have those individual bots, because the thing is, like, users still have their flows of doing stuff. So like, in our example, like, you might still have users go to the HR page and then use the HR bot, because that's what's in their head. They won't think to like, go and find the bot in the chat or anything like that. So I would say, keep those individual bots around, have a, but have another bot which knows just enough about the capabilities of the other bots okay, to like basically signpost. And you can make that signposting really smart. You don't have to tell the bot, well, you can't do that here, you have to do it over there. Like the bot can just be like, hey, sounds like you're asking about HR. Here's the HR bot, I'm gonna feed you the question. You know, either I'm connecting to the HR bot so the user doesn't have to do anything, or you can just go and get the answer and give it back, um, or the, you know, the, whatever it is, the process. So that's what I would do, I would have that master bot, if you like, so that if you're not sure, you go there. But I would kind of keep 
unless, unless you haven't rolled them out already, in which case you've got some choices to make. But if they're there already, I wouldn't take them away from you. Any more for any more? Cool, I shall give you four minutes to jump on the coffee. Thank you.